presentation. I am seeing now that it looks like the session is automatically being recorded. That must be a new function of GoToWebinar, so that's really great to know, Howard. <laughs> People will be happy. They can, they can listen in their pajamas at home whenever they want. Um, also, everyone, this webinar has been pre-approved by the Florida Bar for one hour of CLE. That number will be provided to you at the end of the webinar, and you can always call us or um, email us if you missed that on the last slide. We will be trying to get to your online questions today. So uh, if you do have questions, uh, open up your toolbar by pushing the orange button that's facing to the left, and there should be a question section there. If you have a question for Howard, go ahead and submit that. We will try to get to your questions throughout the seminar and at the end if we have time. If we cannot get to yours uh, today live, Howard will definitely respond to your inquiries um, via email after today, and um, feel free to email him too at um, hmarcy, M-A-R-S-E-E, -E, at uww-adr.com if you want to have a private conversation with him about how to prepare an effective mediation summary. Uh, uh, Sandy, that should, Sandy, that should be HR Marcy. Oh, is it HR? Yes. Got it. I thought all of us were just the first initial and the last name, but HR. I think it, I think that's what it is. Okay, try either one, guys. <laughs> Something is going to get you to uh, Howard and uh, to ask your questions. So, without further ado, I did get a uh, I did get an email from Kathy telling me that we're recording. It looks like everyone is online and ready to go. So, Howard, I have gotten some wonderful mediation summaries in my uh, mediators. Uh, experience and I have gotten some pretty shabby ones too and it really makes a difference as to how the mediation begins. I can have a much quicker um, ramp up time if I am pre-prepared and I know that they're very helpful in helping the other parties as well focus on issues. So if you could maybe go ahead and start and let us know, um, let us know all 185 of us are registered today from around the state. Let us know what the ins and outs are, the do's and don'ts and um, what why are these so important? Thank you, Sandy. Like you, uh, I've been mediating uh, since uh, there has been mediation in Florida, either as an attorney or as a mediator. Uh, and during the course of my practice since the mid-1980s, I have probably read, as best I can calculate, some three or 4,000 mediation statements. Wow. And like you, uh, some have been effective, uh, few have been useless, uh, some have been downright counterproductive. So uh, that's been my experience. But someone asked me recently, actually it's a question I've been asked on more than one occasion, whether a mediation statement is important. And it, it, I think it's a fair question, but it's deceptive uh, in its simplicity. Uh, I think, after a lot of giving it a lot of thought, that the resounding answer is yes, and for reasons that not, until recently I'd not really thought about. Uh, anyone who has tried cases before a judge or a jury, you know, has spent untold labor, thought, and angst uh, in preparing an effective closing argument. And why do we do that? We do that because the closing argument at trial is the terminal event in the lawsuit. It's our last best chance of getting the result that we want. It is today's reality that mediation in a high percentage of cases uh, is the terminal event. It's our last chance to get a result that's favorable to our client. So I would ask why not uh, spend the time and effort that we would put into a closing argument to do an effective uh, a mediation summary because in uh, one sense the mediation summary is in the realities of today's world uh, a, a closing argument of sort. Now I, I have to tell you uh, at the outset that there's no magic formula. I cannot give you a recipe today, and I can't give you a one, two, three 
uh, four type list of things that have to go into a mediation statement. Uh, but I do think that there's a thought process uh, that's very important for us. And I'm going to try to today to, to go through with you um, a, a decision tree, I, uh, I guess I can call it, that may help you in putting together a mediation statement. You trying to get that? Uh, there you go. Uh, uh, got it. Uh, <laughs> I was ready to my, jump in and save you. <laughs> yeah, there's a little lag time on the slide sometimes between the time I push the button. Uh, I, my background was in journalism, and one of the first things that you learn in journalism, Mr. Journalism 101, is that there are five W's and an H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Uh, unless you've covered all those bases, you don't have a story. You'll see on your screen the example, dog bites man. That's not a, that's not a news story. Uh, even if I'm the person who gets bitten by the dog, that's probably not newsworthy. But if it's President Obama, now you've got a news story. Uh, if he bites him in the Rose Garden, you know, that's, that's what happened. When it happened, if it happens during a, a uh, press conference, he, uh, you know, that enhances the story. Where? Why? Well, maybe the dog bit him because uh, he was trying to pet the dog. All of those things go into a good news story. Uh, so I've sort of stolen uh, a bit of the decision tree from that, if this thing goes ahead and advances for me here. Howard, I had to uh, do something on the other screen, so you might need to go okay. ahead and let the PowerPoint know you right. Uh, it seems to me that of the who, what, uh, when, why, where, and how, at least four of those are very important for us in crafting a mediation statement. Uh, why, who, what, when. Where is probably less important because the location of the mediation is something you've hammered out long before you write the mediation statement. How, I don't really see as being applicable. I wish I had an opportunity to redo this slide. I think what I would do is put those in a vertical decision tree. Why at the top, who below that, what below that, and when below that. And for those of you who may be taking notes, you might want to do that. And you'll see as we go through this uh, why uh, that may be helpful for you. As I say, my goal today is uh, not to give you a recipe. No one recipe bakes every cake. I, I often think of Procrustes, for any of you who may be Greek scholars. Uh, Procrustes was uh, an ancient Greek, actually he was the son of Poseidon, who had only w one bed. And when the guests came to uh, his house, if they were too short for the bed, he hammered them out and stretched them to fit the bed. If they were too long for the bed, he cut, cut off their feet. Uh, sometimes I think that's what we do when we do mediation statements. Uh, I was a practicing attorney doing medical malpractice defense when mediation burst onto the scene. Uh, and I still remember my first case that was going to mediation. Um, uh, the first mediation statement I ever saw was from Charlie Abbott, an, an attorney here at Orlando, and he, he was a co representing a co-defendant. So I got his little two-page summary. It had a style at the top. He had obviously filed it with the court. And I said, well, gosh, that looks okay to me. And so I adopted that. What I did is I took a suit report I'd sent to my client and I sort of cherry-picked the best items, the ones that I thought were most advantageous to me in negotiation, plugged it into the suit report, uh, added a sufficient amount of bombast to make everyone feel that I and my client were important, and that's what I sent uh, to the mediator. I did not send one to the other uh, attorneys. Well, I got some from other attorneys. Uh, 
they, uh, of course, complained that I should have sent them a copy. In the early days of mediation, nobody knew what they were doing. Uh, and um, some filed them with the court, some didn't. Uh, and, and I tended, though, like most people, to sort of follow that same general routine over the years until I became a mediator. And I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes people make, that is they get into a pattern without ever, think, ever thinking why they're doing it. Why am I preparing a mediation ceremony? This is the top thing in your, in your decision tree. Uh, you need to ask yourself, why am I doing this thing? Uh, I, I guess a fair question to ask is, do I need a summary at all? Um, there are some people who are of an opinion that, that you may not in a very simple case. I can think of some cases where you, it's a recurring type case, maybe it's a slip and fall case, and you and the mediator and the defense attorney have done the same case at the same grocery store for 20 or 30 times, and it's just not cost effective to do a mediation summary for your client. Maybe you don't need it in that case. But I think, by and large, most cases need a mediation summary. But questions I would ask myself, how complex are, complex are the facts or issues? Uh, the more complex, the more likely you are to need a mediation summary. Uh, do I want to prepare the mediator to advocate my client's cause? To me, that's the single biggest goal that you ought to have in your mediation summary. You, you ought to always be looking to give that mediator a tool to advocate for your client. Uh, do I need to educate myself? I think sometimes in the very act of preparing a mediation summary, uh, you learn things about your case that maybe you had relegated to the recesses of your mind. Uh, educate my client. I don't know how many of you have given a thought as to whether you should send a copy of your summary to your client. Um, and we'll talk about who gets it in a moment. But, but that could be one of your goals. Maybe you've got a difficult client and the client needs to uh, get a, a grip on the case. Do I educate the opposing party? How about creating a framework for mediation? Uh, for instance, you know, if it's a complex case, uh, the mediator may need to know which issues have got to be resolved first, which parties need to settle first. Maybe you have several defendants. If you're the plaintiff's attorney, it seems to me you ought to be telling the mediator, well, uh, you know, I can settle with these defendants, but I probably have to settle with defendant A first, or I can settle with defendant B, but I can't settle with defendant C. Uh, you know, all those variables. Uh, who's the target defendant in the case? You know, that may be something that you need to tell uh, the mediator. Well, the person I really think has the most liability in this case is defendant B. Um, the need for funding, uh, annuities, amortization, structure, settlement, is that something that's going to have to be discussed? Uh, vicarious liability. Uh, so all of those are things that you may have as a goal of educating the mediator and maybe the other parties. Uh, maybe you want to establish a template for settlement so that the mediator will have some idea what a settlement agreement will look like at the end of the day. So if you're going to do that, it seems that maybe you want to have uh, uh, enough information for the mediator to assist them on that. Closely intertwined with the questions of why and what uh, and uh, are the, is the question of who. And again, looking at your decision tree, if you know why you want to write it, uh, if you know who you're going to send it to, then as you'll see later, that determines what goes into it. Who gets the mediation summary? Uh, I suspect that a great many people send it to the mediator only. At least the ones I get 
almost invariably say at the top that this is confidential and for your use only. Yeah, Which most of mine are too, Howard. Mine are, mine are that way, for the, primarily. Yes, and, and that indicates to me that they're not sending it to anyone else. Uh, and it seems to me that they may be overlooking uh, a real opportunity when they do that. Um, should I place restrictions on the mediator's use of the summary? Again, almost invariably, I see at the very top of the mediation, eyes only, or words to that effect. Well, it may well be that there are some things in the summary that you would want to share with the other party. A classic example is I will frequently, in a plaintiff's case, particularly a catastrophic injury case, have the plaintiff's attorney set forth in sometimes a page a careful calculation of all the economic damages. Um, but still they restrict me from sharing that with the other party. Usually what I'll do when I get to the mediation I'll, is I'll ask uh, the plaintiff's attorney at that point, may I share this? And they almost always say, oh yes, I think you need to. But maybe uh, we shouldn't so blindly place restrictions on the mediator's use of the summary. Maybe we ought to be selective in what we allow the mediator to share and not share. Do we send it to both the mediator and opposing counsel? Uh, that gets trickier, but it can be done. It definitely uh, um, uh, affects the content that you put in it, as we'll see later. What about to the co-defendants and other parties? Um, suppose that you have a situation where uh, you're in a medical malpractice case and you're, you're representing a defendant and your defendant ultimately is going to say, I wasn't negligent. If I had been told by Nurse Jones uh, that the patient was having heart palpitations, I would have done something differently. Obviously, you're going to be pointing the finger at Nurse Jones. Well, that may not be the type of thing you want to share with the co-defendants because then they point the finger back at you. Uh, that may be a situation where you have to be careful of what you supply to co-defendants. You certainly may need to tell the mediator, that, look, I think Nurse Jones is the culprit here. But I don't know that you want to tell the co-defendants that. But it's that sort of thought process that needs to go into it. Does your client get the mediation summary? Um, this, I think, depends in large part on who your client is. If your client is a large institutional client, insurance company, for instance, they're going to expect it. If it's a, a more a less sophisticated client, say a lower socioeconomic plaintiff, you may want to be careful with sharing that with that client because you may be creating unrealistic expectations. Uh, remember that when you do the mediation summary uh, that you're to some extent trying to put lipsticks on lipstick on the pig. Uh, so you, you know, you're trying to paint your case in pretty glowing terms. Uh, if your client is going to be susceptible to ending up with unrealistic expectations from that, then maybe you need to be a little more cautious. Should I consider, consider sending different versions to different recipients? Yeah, I don't see many people that do that, but it seems to me that is something that uh, um, maybe uh, uh, people ought to consider. Howard, we have a question on that topic. Sure. Um, the question that we've received is, can you discuss whether any of the underlying quote-unquote gotcha facts or legal theories should be disclosed to the mediator when you do not want those facts disclosed to the other side unless a settlement is on the verge of happening. So that's obviously something that you would consider maybe putting in your version that goes to the mediator for ultimate use uh, down the road and not obviously in the, in the version that you send to the other parties. What are your thoughts about that? Well, as I understand the question, uh, you have some um, defensive uh, material that you, you'll disclose, but only if it appears that it's going to settle the case at the very end. Right. Tell the mediator that. I think it's important for the mediator to know that. 
uh, a lot depends on your relationship with the mediator, how well you know the mediator. Uh, if you if it's a strange mediator, you haven't worked with them a lot, uh, and these are really sensitive uh, facts. Maybe you have surveillance film of uh, this person who's now in a wheelchair climbing a ladder with two five-gallon buckets. Um, yeah, I can see making a case for either divulging that to the mediator early or uh, using it later in the case. Uh, but uh, I, as a general rule, I like to know as much as I can about the case when I go to mediate a case. Uh, because I think that helps me to know fallback positions and uh, exactly where uh, everyone is going in the case. I, I hope that's answered the question. Yes, I think it does. Thank you. I took control of the webinar, uh, the uh, PowerPoints. So you need to uh, do your left click. There you go. There we go. So what information do I include in the summary? Remember our decision tree. The content is directly dependent upon why you're doing it uh, and who you're sending it to. Uh, some considerations. Uh, what if you have no intentions of settling the case uh, and you really don't want to share information with the opposing counsel? Well, sharing it with the mediator is not the same as sharing it with the opposing counsel, obviously. So the question becomes, do you share it with the mediator? Uh, and do you tell the mediator, I have no intention of settling this case, uh, and I'm not going to tell you anything about the case? Uh, I'm not sure that that's something you ought to do. It's, if you really have no intention of settling the case and you don't want to share information, I would at least do a pro forma summary to the mediator and and maybe share that information with the mediator. There is a downside to that, and I call it the getting painted in a corner problem. Uh, you you may have no intention of settling this case today, uh, but your client might, uh, and your client may have no intention of settling this case today, but they may tomorrow. So. To some extent, you're putting yourself in a position of having to eat a little crow later on. Uh, will the summary be read by the opposing party? And I mean a party here, not the attorney. This is something that I see, uh, it seems to me, uh, a potential that a lot of people overlook. Day in and day out in the course of a lawsuit, if I am the defense attorney, um, every communication I have with the plaintiff's attorney is getting passed on to the plaintiff through the filter of the plaintiff's attorney. Conversely, the plaintiff's uh, attorney, everything the plaintiff's attorney is conveying to the defendant is getting passed on to the defendant through the filter of the defendant's attorney. If you, if, particularly if I'm the plaintiff's attorney, and I think that by supplying my summary to the opposing counsel, it'll end up in the hands of the insurance representative or the defendant. This is my chance to do an end run around that attorney uh, to make sure they're hearing the case as I see it. So that might be both the reason you'd want to send a copy of your mediation uh, summary to the other attorney uh, because, as well as the mediator, because it may be read by his or her client. Uh, so that's something I, I think I'd be thinking about. Of course, if you're going to do that, then keep in mind that that affects the content that you're going to put in it. What effect will the summary have on my own client? I think we've talked about that. Uh, you don't want to create unrealistic expectations in your own client. Uh, that's, uh, that's always something that you need to be uh, considerate of. question I'm often asked is why not substitute my motion for summary judgment, my suit report, or the pleadings in the case? And I see this more frequently than I think I should. On the motion for summary judgment, it's rare 
that a motion for summary judgment is the totally dispositive of the case. I know the attorneys may think it is, but when it comes to mediate the case, a lot of factors go into it other than will I win or lose my motion for summary judgment. Uh, because you always, if you have a motion for summary judgment hanging fire out there in the hands of the court, you don't know whether you're going to win or lose it. So I would not just send my motion for summary judgment absent a case where it really is everything in the case uh, because there are just too many other aspects of the case that may come into play. Suit report, same thing. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'd give my suit report to the mediator as a substitute for a mediation summary <clears throat> because the suit report, uh, first off, is going to suffer from some lack of focus. Suit reports, as a rule, and I've drafted hundreds of them as a defense attorney, tend to be fairly comprehensive. They may be more comprehensive than the mediator needs uh, for uh, the purpose of analyzing and zeroing into the critical things that are going to settle uh, the case. Pleadings in the case, when I get nothing but pleadings in the case as a mediator, they don't tell me much. I think it, when I open my file, I want to see at least one pleading. It gives me the names of the parties and the jurisdiction, the venue, the names of the attorneys and who they represent. But uh, the pleadings as a substitute for the motion uh, for the uh, mediation summary simply don't give you any feel for the uh, issues in the case, uh, the discovery that's gone on, uh, the uh, in short, uh, the real issues in the case. Here's some content I would consider. Uh, I, I would certainly always identify all parties in the respective roles. The mediator is going to need that. He's going to be an effective advocate for you. Uh, you're going to need to identify all counsel and mediation attendees in their roles. Here again, it's just a uh, nuts and bolts thing that the mediator is going to need and enough detail to help the mediator effectively advocate my client's cause. The last, though, I think is very important on numerous levels. So on, on both a, I guess I could call it a textual level and a metadata level. A carefully reasoned analysis that demonstrates my mastery of the facts and law in the case. Trust and credibility are critical when you sit down to negotiate, uh, you want your mediator to go into the other room confident that your analysis is correct, that you have a total grip on the case, uh, so that he then is armed with what he needs to advocate for you. Uh, I think every uh, summary ought to include uh, sufficient information to, sh to demonstrate that. Now, you can have too much detail in a case. Uh, sometimes, because I tend to mediate a fair number of medical malpractice cases, I will get, I know it's been done by a nurse paralegal, a minute-by-minute minute recitation of everything that happened from the day the patient saw the first doctor until the time they died. Uh, that doesn't really prove all that helpful. Uh, because somewhere along the line you need to focus in on the key times and the key events in the patient's course of treatment uh, so that the mediator will know what's important and what's not. Uh, try not to uh, burden the mediation summary with things that merely uh, add to the smoke and haze uh, around the issues. 
You know, Howard, I wanted to interject, if you don't mind. I find, sure. um, and I don't know if you found this to be true, I have found very few of the mediation statements that I've gotten to be persuasive writing. They're more uh, just the facts, very factual. And I think that I would benefit as a mediator from seeing some persuasive writing. Um, I can, fa I can fare it through. What's, what's, you know, what's, you know, are you trying to persuade me or not? I can, I can see what's, what's being done, but I'd like to see what your, you know, what your approach is going to be. And if you put it in writing, then I know in advance what it's going to be. Um, but very few of the of the mediation summaries that I get are actually persuasive pieces of writing. They're more factual, and and that's actually less helpful to me. It's somewhat helpful for background purposes, but as a mediator, it's not helping me figure out where this is going to go and what the what the you know uh, what the potential arguments are. I agree with you, Sandy. You, you know, you you want to persuade the mediator to be your advocate. But you do that through a carefully reasoned analysis, uh, and, and of course, uh, some skill skills in writing are always a plus. Yeah. Uh, uh, some more content. Uh, I, I think it's probably smart to put in a general statement of your client's goals at mediation. And you note that I've used the word general there. Uh, I, I don't know that uh, you need to go through with very minute details what your client's goals are, because the mediation process and negotiation is a fluid thing, and uh, they're apt to change as, as the day wears on. But still, I think uh, you know, it's helpful for the mediator to know what your general goals are. Uh, obstacles to settlement or special problems. For instance, you may have insurance coverage problems. You may be a plaintiff's attorney, and I see this frequently, who has a client who's in a wheelchair, and it's a, conservatively, it's a $10 million case. But uh, unfortunately, of the two defendants, one has no insurance coverage, and, and uh, she's the one who is the most negligent. That's a real problem, needless to say. So that's something maybe you need to just t touch on with the mediator right up front. If there's bad blood between the parties, uh, I'll never forget mediating a road rage case where we had to find a, two adjacent buildings with an easy walking distance, and we had the plaintiff in one building and the defendant in the other. So I walked from building to building. Uh, you know, those are types of things you need to know. So there can be bad blood uh, uh, between the attorneys. Maybe the mediator ought to know that if he he or she is going to be effective. Maybe one party is insolvent. Uh, that could be uh, an, an obstacle. Uh, maybe you're dealing with a difficult adjuster or personality on the other side. Again, as a mediator, I find that very, very helpful. Uh, maybe you have problems with client control, either your pro client or the other parties. These are things, I don't know, Sandy, you might comment on that, but it, these are things I think are very important for the mediator to know. Absolutely. I think that the more that the mediator can be told in advance, the better. Um, it gives us a chance to process things in advance and come to, come to the mediation up and running, ready to go. Um, and I just uh, I think that the I think that mediation summaries are a lost art, or maybe an art that people no one's really even mastered yet. But I think that they're of vital importance in educating the mediator, and you know, like you said, trying to persuade them to to push your um, your your theory of the case or your position in the case. Um, me mediator may not do that, but that's that's the goal ultimately. Just like you're trying to persuade a an appellate judge or a, a panel of judges what your position is. Yet more content, special provisions or contingencies that the settlement agreement must address. For instance, it's a case involving Medicare site uh, set asides, confidentiality. Uh, maybe they're mon non monetary things. Maybe it's an employment case. It's very important to the employee if he can get his job back. Uh, maybe there needs to be a structured settlement 
if it's going to get resolved. All these are type things that uh, I think we need to anticipate and let the mediator uh, participate in the anticipation. Whether partial settlement's an option, you may well have a case where you foresee part of it being settled but not all of it. Um, and maybe the mediator needs to know that partial settlement is a fallback option. Uh, whether a structured settlement is an option, you have a severely damaged uh, uh, plaintiff and uh, structured settlement, if you're the plaintiff's attorney, may not only be an option, it may be an obligation to your client uh, uh, to, yeah, to help control uh, the, how fast they spend their money. Any, and I always think it's important when I get the background of past negotiations or mediations. Uh, and there's two very basic rules uh, for that. Plaintiffs never hear a lower number than the highest number they last heard. Defendants never hear uh, a higher number, I, I'm sorry, a lower number than the lowest number they ever heard. So you, you need to make sure uh, that uh, you've told the mediator what the expectations are. Uh, one problem I sometimes encounter, and I, find, I call this the bait and switch, uh, the plaintiff's attorney has sent a letter to the defense attorney uh, with a low demand, let's say fifty thousand uh, dollars, as an enticement to get to mediation, uh, you you let the media and the def you get a mediation summary from the defendant saying, "Look, we got this demand of fifty thousand. Um, that's it's probably worth going to mediation." You get to mediation, and the plaintiff's attorney is now at two million dollars. I had this happen to me twice in one day with one plaintiff's attorney recently. Uh, uh, needless to say, that is a recipe for disaster for, on any number of levels. Um, I took the the, um, the mouse for a second to check a question, okay. so you can go ahead and take that back. Okay. Things I think that you probably ought to consider avoiding are ad hominem attacks on parties or counsel. Uh, that does no good for uh, for you, it seems to me, uh, even in a summary to the mediation, I mean to the mediator. Um, I think mediators as a rule like to think that the parties are adults and are careful, uh, reasoning people, analytical people, and when you fill your mediation summary with diatribes against the other person, uh, I'm not sure that does much. I think it's more reflection on the writer than on the other uh, people. Over-the-top hyperbole, and incidentally for you who are English students, over-the-top hyperbole is itself an over-the-top hyperbole. Uh, you know, be, beware of over-exaggeration or misstatements of fact or law. One big problem you have with that, if you send me a mediation summary that's filled with misstatements of fact or law, the first time I go into a caucus with the opposing party and try to use what you've told me, I'm going to lose credibility and so are you. Uh, so many times I've gone in and represented what's been represented to me and had the other party say, well, that plaintiff's attorney is, doesn't understand her case. She doesn't know what's going on. This is so typical of, of, of her. Uh, so be very careful with misstatements. They, they damage trust. They damage your credibility with both the mediator and the other party. They damage the mediator's credibility with the other party. And then he or she may not be as uh, effective uh, an advocate for your cause. Overly rigid de declarations of positions or intentions. Um, I think because mediation is a fluid process, uh, 
no one should ever take overly rigid declarations or, or positions. Um, invective, obviously invective. Uh, I wish I, I, I wish I could share with you uh, some of the things I've heard uh, one attorney say about the other. Uh, I, I sometimes cringe when I hear those things. Um, and of course, avoid statements designed to throw gasoline on the fire. When do I send the summary? Remember our decision tree. Why am I doing it? Who's getting it? What's in it? And once you know all those things, then you know when to send it. Um, if I expect the opposing counsel will send a copy on to his or her client, then I want to send it in time uh, for that to happen. How complicated is the case? If it's a complex case, then I want to send it in time for everybody to digest it or, or whoever's getting it. If that's uh, the mediator, that's fine. If the mediator is one who typically gets involved in the case prior to the formal mediation session, then you may want to get it to him or her uh, uh, earlier rather than later so they have time to go through that process. Uh, if you're sending it to your client, do they need, need time to digest it? Yeah, Howard, I'd like to add, I, um, I'm seeing a trend of getting them maybe a day in advance, and that just doesn't give me a chance to, to, to review it and then, and then follow up with some follow-up questions or do some follow-up contacts and, uh, over the phone with the, with the parties. So I, I think that um, you know, three, four, or five days a week, depending on the complexity of the case, is, is really uh, important. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, then more when considerations. Uh, am I providing copies to co-defendants or other parties? That may affect your timing. What is the mediator requested? No one ever reads my engagement letter, I'm convinced. I think I typically <laughs> ask for mediation uh, summaries 10 days in advance. And that's probably an excessive time for most cases, uh, but, but not for complex cases. And I read the summaries in advance. Uh, you know, I think uh, your, your better mediators read these summaries uh, before the night before the mediation, uh, because sometimes they necessitate phone calls or follow-up. What's the court order? Sometimes I think people don't read the court orders, because some court orders I see clearly mandate a certain time period, uh, but still uh, they, they come in later. And then two things that maybe you ought to consider. I think we're all aware of the principle of primacy and the principle of recency. Principle of primacy, of course, is what people uh, hear and see first is the most persuasive. If you subscribe to that theory, then maybe you want the mediator to get your summary before he gets the other summaries. If you happen to follow the principle of recency, which is the things I, uh, people see and hear most recently are the most persuasive, and maybe you want to get it in later. Uh, that may sound like splitting hairs, but keep in mind, if you were doing a closing argument, you would be thinking about that level of detail. And then the need for action prior to mediation by the mediator or other parties. Uh, one, I think, if you're sending your mediation summary to the defendant, uh, and if it's a defendant representing an institution or an insurance company, you've got to give them time to digest it and respond to it. You may be dealing with an insurance company that has uh, five or six authority levels. They may have to go to two or three or four different committees to get uh, differing amounts of money. So you know, that's something that you need to think about. Frequently asked questions. I think I've answered the first one, motion for summary judgment or pleadings. Uh, should I tell my mediator in the summary what my absolutely best settlement number or position will be? Um, that's a tough one. I think it depends on your mediator and your relationship with the mediator. Uh, if you're going to do that, however, you need to remember, again, that mediation is a fluid process and what you think is your best settlement number today may not necessarily be what your best settlement number is tomorrow and it may not even be what your client's 
best settlement number is today. Um, uh, you know, if you have a very, keep in mind that the mediator, unless the mediator really knows you, he and she is going to almost invariably take what you say with a grain of salt. Because most people uh, uh, misrepresent their final position during the course of negotiations, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think most mediators realize that. Uh, so even if you tell the mediator that this is absolutely my best settlement number, they may not totally be persuaded that that's true. So I don't know that you really help yourself by doing it. You know, Howard, I had the opposite happen recently. I had someone tell me after many, many, many hours of mediation that they were at their bottom number. And um, I believed them and uh, went ahead and declared an impasse. And when I went ahead and told the other party that the, the other side had left because we were at an impasse, they said, well, we, we weren't done. And I said, well, you told me you were done. <laughs> you know, I'm, I can't read the tea leaves here. If you told me you were done, and I've asked you several times, are we done? And you tell me you're at your bottom number, I'm going to believe you. <laughs> so I'm, I, I guess some mediators work the opposite way. I don't, I take it with a grain of salt. You, I believe what you tell me. Um, I mean, I know that there's always room for some maneuvering. But uh, yeah, being honest and open with your mediator is of uh, uh, critical importance. Yes, well, I agree, but but I have learned through bitter experience that you always have to leave a little room for doubt in what people yeah. tell you in negotiations. Yeah, I learned that lesson the hard way. Yeah, yeah. that was a hard one to learn. So, uh, I know we're getting near the end, so I'm going to go through uh, these last few things fairly quickly. Should I designate my summary to the mediator confidential? Uh, give it some thought. Don't do it just as a knee-jerk reaction. If you really want it to be confidential, yes. Maybe there are parts that need to be confidential and part not, but don't just do it as a needs or automatic thing. Do I ever file it with a court? I've never, I've never heard of that. Who bears the mediator's fee for review of mediation summaries? Uh, absent some extraordinary circumstance, I think most mediators simply divide the time equally uh, among the uh, parties or number of attorneys. Do they make a difference? I do believe they do. The common mistakes, uh, ignore, I, I took a survey of several of my colleagues to come up with these. Ignoring relevant insurance coverage limitations uh, is one that was listed. Overemphasizing liability issue and losing sight of damage issues. And uh, uh, failing to prior, uh, prioritize or refine the issues, that is, just a sort of blunder bus uh, versus a rifle shot approach. Zero in on what the real issues are. Uh, failing to be concise, objective, and calm. And then I want to share this last thing with you. Rod Max, who some of you will know as uh, one of the premier mediators uh, in the Southeast, has this suggested list of summary contents. Now, I told you earlier I couldn't give you a recipe or a list, and I don't pretend that this is it. I think you still have to apply your decision tree to what goes in it. But Rod's list of items that you may or may not go uh, put in the summary are certainly things you should consider putting in the summary. And I'm not going to read through them. You see them on your screen. Um, and then uh, this is a continuation of that list. Howard, we're probably going to go ahead and put these on um, uh, SlideShare. So anyone who is watching that would like to um, see them on SlideShare, we'll go ahead and post them probably in the next couple of days at that website. Yep. And then I simply leave this as a parting thought. I'll let you read it, but it's, uh, it's a quote from uh, 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 I, I'm trying to remember which. There's a famous negotiator. And I thought I had it on here, but I don't. Uh, trust and credibility are everything in negotiation. Uh, without those, you, you're, uh, you're hurting. If you have any idea you're going to browbeat anybody into anything, you should always remember, you can call this the Howard Marcy principle. Nobody likes to make concessions to a jerk. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, 
All right, I enjoyed uh, talking with you today. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to email me. Howard, thank you so much. Uh, what I failed to mention uh, in our introduction portion was that Howard uh, was a uh, English major with a journalism minor, and his writing is is just fantastic, a spectacle to behold. I, I love reading what he has to write. I love attending his webinars and seminars. Uh, I always bring home. Um, the little bit of the, uh, I've got a little bit of grammar snob in me, and uh, Howard and I can relate to that. We're always trying to figure out which is the right word to use and how to use it in the context and all that. So Howard, uh, thank you for telling us a little bit about crafting the effective mediation summary. And yes, I think we all agree after today's presentation, it is important. Uh, everyone who is watching, all 130 of you, the Florida Bar CLE approval number is 1403940N as in Nancy. Of course, if you have any questions or need us to repeat that to you, just email Howard at hmarcy at uww-adr.com or Kathy Klasny at our office, C. K-L-A-S-N-E at uww-adr.com. We have several webinars coming up in the future. We have Bob Cole and Rutledge Lyles coming up on September 16th at noon. They're going to do a 1.5 uh, CLE webinar on the topic of uh, ADR um, and ethics and alternative dispute resolution. Those ethics uh, CLEs are always really popular, so please join in with that. You should be getting uh, an email invitation to that. If you have friends that would like to receive the email invitation, just email Kathy at the email uh, address on your screen and she'll get that out to you. If you have any topics that you'd like to recommend to us, uh, ADR related, mediation related, um, any kind of dispute resolution topic you'd like to see Upchurch, Watson, White, and Max offer in the future, please email me or Howard or Kathy or any of us, and we will get that. Uh, we will get that. Um, uh, started for you. I'm getting all kinds of questions about the CLE approvals. Um, we'll try and get you some of these answers. Uh, Alabama has a different CLE approval process than what we have here in Florida. We can get you a certificate of attendance and then you can go ahead and present that to Alabama and I know typically they are approved there. Um, I'm getting uh, lots of uh, feedback about people wanting to attend our next one. We do have them monthly. We will be offering uh, Brandon and Peters and Michelle Jernigan will be offering one in October. We have Chuck Mancuso offering one in November, and we have Judy Bass who will be offering one in December, which will round out our year at Upchurch, Watson, White, and Max mediation series. So Howard, thank you once again. You did a wonderful job. I appreciate your time and your um, efforts efforts in putting the PowerPoint together. It was beautiful and helpful. And Kathy, thank you as always for your help. From all of us here to all of you around the state of Florida and in Alabama, of course, um, we at Upchurch, Watson, White, and Max, thank you for attending, for being a part of this. And we end by saying ciao for now. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Howard.